This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined remotely by co-host uh, Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Hello, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Well, the U.S. death toll from COVID-19 has passed 450,000. Over 3,900 people died of the disease just Wednesday alone. And another major milestone, data gathered by the COVID tracking project, shows vaccinations in the United States have eclipsed the number of people who have been infected with the coronavirus. More than 27 million have received a first shot, and nearly 6 million have been given both vaccine doses. This comes as the Biden administration says it still expects to reach its target of 100 million vaccines in its first 100 days, and the number of deaths and people hospitalized continues to fall. But the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, warned Wednesday new COVID-19 variants may reverse this trend. Although we have seen declines in cases and admissions and a recent slowing of deaths, cases remain extraordinarily high, still twice as high as the peak number of cases over the summer. And the continued proliferation of variants, variants that likely have increased transmissibility, that spread more easily, threatens to reverse these recent trends. As multiple new strains of the coronavirus spread across the United States, the government's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, said Monday, people must be vaccinated as quickly as possible to stop more mutations from emerging. Need to get vaccinated when it becomes available as quickly and as expeditiously as possible throughout the country. And the reason for that is that there is a fact that permeates virology, and that is that viruses cannot mutate if they don't replicate. This comes as health experts warn any vaccination progress in the United States will be threatened without global vaccine equity. For more, we're joined by Dr. Waha El Sadr, professor of epidemiology and medicine at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health and director of ICAP at Columbia University. She recently co authored an op ed in the New York Times headlined, The World is Desperate for More COVID Vaccines, that argues. Two decades ago, the U.S. launched a program to help supply the world with HIV medication. It should take a similar approach to COVID. Doctor, welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. I wanted to start with this watershed moment that we are in, facing the race between the vaccines and the virus. Explain what's happening. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for having me today. Um, I think we are exactly at this watershed moment uh, because what we have is the potential uh, for garnering the benefits of the vaccines we have uh, discovered thus far, uh, while at the same time we're also seeing uh, uh, the growth in terms of the numbers of new uh, COVID cases, as well as also the identification of these new variants, these new mutations in the virus that uh, potentially um, uh, could threaten uh, the effectiveness of, of, uh, of even our vaccines. So I think what this means is that we have to do two things at the same time. We need to, as quickly as possible, expand access to the vaccines, both in this country, in the United States, as well as also around the world. That's number one. And number two, we must continue to make every effort to stop transmission uh, from one person to the next, because this is exactly what generates these mutations, these new variants. And that must continue to be done by the usual public health preventive measures that we are all familiar with. The physical distancing, the masking um, is, is critically important, avoiding large congregations of people, uh, avoiding socializing at this point in time. So I think we have to be working on these two pathways, scale up of vaccines locally and globally, and at the same time, do everything we can to stop transmission of the virus. 
Uh, Dr. El Sadr, you talked about um, vaccine access, the the importance of vaccine access in this uh, New York Times op-ed, where you point out that it was Dr. Fauci himself uh, regarding the the HIV uh, and AIDS uh, virus. It was Dr. Fauci at the time who persuaded then President uh, George W. Bush to start PEPFAR, uh, the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief that made uh, AIDS HIV medication accessible to large numbers of people around the world, uh, saving uh, up to 18 million lives, as, as you write. Uh, what is it that you're advocating uh, the Biden administration do to enable access globally uh, to the COVID vaccines in a similar way. Yes, I think we we do have this historic precedent uh, that I think is probably one of uh, people do recognize that PEPFAR, uh, the global HIV uh, program that's uh, supported by the United States government, is probably one of the most successful ever. Uh, foreign assistance programs that has received bipartisan supports for decades now. And I think the, the this is a model that can be emulated at this point in time in recognition of the fact that uh, viruses know no borders. And the, what happens in a country in sub-Saharan Africa has an, with regards to COVID has an impact on what happens right here in our own country. Uh, so the model is that, um, is that the importance of prioritizing uh, the procurement, the support for the development of these vaccines uh, around the world so that they can actually reach the largest numbers of people possible, particularly in low and middle income countries. Uh, so it's both uh, making available the vaccines themselves or making available the technology uh, that supports the development of these vaccines. Uh, at the same time, also investment, investing their resources to be able to uh, support vaccination programs. We know that you need the vaccines, obviously, but we also need to have effective large-scale vaccination programs in order to get the benefits of these vaccines uh, anywhere. Uh, Dr. Elsether, you also say in the same piece that the mRNA vaccines, which both uh, Moderna and Pfizer use, are easier and faster to manufacture than most other vaccine technologies. But of course, uh, these vaccines are extremely difficult to transport and to store, given the temperatures at which they have to be uh, kept. Could you talk about what you think? I mean, the Russia vaccine, Sputnik V, has just been shown to have 92 percent efficacy. Uh, there are other vaccines uh, that developing countries are attempting to access, uh, the China vaccine, Sinopharm, Sinovac. How easy or difficult is it, uh, given the technologies those vaccines use, uh, to manufacture and produce and uh, disseminate widely and quickly? I think in the end we're going to, we're going to need to need really a mix of different types of vaccines and it depends really on the setting there are some settings where it is quite feasible to uh, to be able to keep um, some of these mRNA uh, vaccines, uh, availability of freezers, for example, refrigerators and so on. And then there are other settings where it is going to be very difficult uh, because of the lack of stuff, of these kinds of, uh, of resources. So in the end, I think it's going to depend on the setting uh, and uh, the location within different countries and so on. So I do think we need to be flexible. We need to be uh, cognizant of the realities on the ground and do the very best that we can uh, to enable that in the end countries would have different options that they can then seek whatever option fits best within their reality and that fits best within their uh, their own context i think there's not going to be one answer uh, but i think there needs to be work on all fronts uh, to enable uh, ultimately that people from these countries have access to the vaccine because uh, it is the right thing to do, but it also is in the self-interest of, uh, of our own country as well. Dr. Wafa Al-Sadr, can you address the issue of those concerned about the vaccine? Um, a new study has come out today from Monmouth University that says in the United States, maybe half the people um, plan to get vaccinated as soon as they can. But a quarter say they never will. Um, 
We see very little information about negative side effects of these vaccines, though millions have gotten them. Would it help people to believe more in the vaccine if we heard about the thousands of, well, complaints and concerns uh, that people have with the vaccine? I think that uh, absolutely. I think we are all very, as public health professionals and, and uh, researchers, we're very concerned about um, uh, what, what has been called vaccine hesitancy, which uh, is it could be because simply people don't have the accurate information about the vaccine itself. So that's very important, just disseminating information about the vaccine and how it was developed and what it does and what it doesn't do. I think. Uh, uh, another aspect of, of hesitancy sometimes is because of uh, a legacy of mistrust, uh, for example, uh, among certain uh, groups of our own population and global populations in terms of mistrust of government, mistrust of research. And for that, we need to uh, engage um, individuals uh, from these same communities, trusted messengers, trusted champions, who can talk to their peers about what the vaccines do and what they don't do. We also need at the same time to also share information as it as information arises in terms of uh, any side effects uh, from these vaccines and uh, the magnitude uh, of, of such side effects. Uh, I think it's really important to be uh, con to be transmitting the information, thinking about what are the best channels for transmitting the information. And very importantly is being very transparent about the information that we have. We're very fortunate that thus far with all of the vaccines uh, for which we've seen results have been first of all, remarkably effective, they work, and also have been remarkably safe. Uh, the safety profile has been very comforting, and, uh, and I think that's really of great so importance. why do you think it is, Dr. Al-Sadr, that perhaps up to a third of healthcare professionals say they will not take the vaccine? That does not inspire confidence, and what is the reasoning? There are multiple reasons uh, for this. I think, again, healthcare workers are, are not, uh, are also uh, part of our society, our community. And uh, there are, again, many people or from certain subsets of our communities, particularly amongst African Americans, for example, Hispanics and Latinx uh, populations in this country, uh, who, because of the legacy, I mentioned the legacy of mistrust and prior abuses in research, are leery uh, of. Uh, of anything that comes uh, from the government, including these very valuable vaccines. And I think it's going to take a lot of work for us to be able to gain their trust and keep uh, sharing the information. But most importantly, beyond the knowledge, it is uh, really reaching people from the same communities who can then uh, talk about uh, their own experiences, why they vaccinated, and, uh, and then demonstrate to others that it is in their interest and the interest of their family and communities to be vaccinated. It's not going to happen overnight, but we need to be working on this very diligently, uh, engaging with the communities that have these, uh, this, uh, the, the fear of these vaccines and, and so that we, gain their, we can gain their trust. It will take a lot of work, a lot of partnerships, a lot of commitment, and being willing to listen uh, to their concerns and answer their concerns. And Dr. al Seller, as I'm sure you're aware, vaccine hesitancy is not just a problem in the U.S., but also mm -hmm. across the world. Uh, France has one of the highest rates, but also places like uh, South Africa and Kuwait. So could you talk about how views of vaccination and why views of vaccination have changed in this way and what the implications are if large numbers of people or even significant numbers of people around the world refuse the vaccine when it's uh, made available to them? I think that's an issue of globally uh, of great concern. It's like you said, it's not just in the U.S. It's in in almost every corner of this globe, and people are, you know, when you think about when you ask individuals, they're on a spectrum. There are people who are uh, ready and willing to get vaccinated as soon as they're eligible. They're going to really be the fr at the front of the line. They're, they're convinced. They're ready uh, to act. And then on the other extreme are people who 
simply don't believe in vaccines for a variety of different reasons. Vaccines overall, not just this COVID vaccine. And then most people are somewhere in the middle and uh, they are seeking answers to their questions. Uh, they are seeking reassurance. Uh, they're seeking, uh, they're looking for others like them to have been vaccinated. And I think we, we're now focusing on these individuals who are uh, on, this, on the spectrum of these people who have who have concerns, who have issues, who have certain beliefs, and working with them diligently to try to overcome uh, some of their uh, some of the the myths they may believe, and also to try, like I said, to engage people whom they trust. This is very important. Uh, what I'm seeing now is uh, some of the narratives, storytelling around the vaccines. People who are standing up from some of these same communities and saying, you know. I went and I get vaccinated because I did it for my family. I did it for my community. And that can be a very powerful statement coming from someone from these same communities. And we need to be doing this in the U.S. as well as around the world as well. Uh, and, and I think in, in this day and age, it's particularly important to, to do this very uh, ag actively because, of course, of social media and the ability to disseminate sometimes erroneous information about side effects of, of vaccines. Uh, and I think we need to be very nimble uh, to be able to, again, respond to some of these, uh, some of these, uh, some of these erroneous messages. Dr. Osada, uh, I wanted to ask you about the current controversy in the United States. This is CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky speaking during a briefing reporters Wednesday about the reopening of schools and vaccines for teachers. I would also say that um, safe reopening of schools is not, um, that vaccination of teachers is not a prerequisite for safe reopening of schools. President Biden has said he wants to reopen a majority of K-8 through schools in his first 100 days. But during a meeting with teachers' unions last Thursday, Dr. Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, said it may not happen. The goal. That may not happen, because there may be mitigating circumstances. Well, can you, Dr. El Sadr, address this issue of whether parents, teachers and kids should be concerned about in-person learning and what it means for Dr. Walensky to say, yes, uh, people should go back to school even if teachers are not fully vaccinated? Well, I think we have data now that um, there are very reassuring. So over the past year, since the beginning of this, uh, of this pandemic, there's been accumulating data that have shown again and again that uh, tr transmission in schools is not the problem. It is not that uh, schools have been breeding grounds for transmission of COVID-19. Uh, this has been shown in a variety of different programs around this country and around the world uh, for a lot of different reasons. One is that we have some data that uh, transmission from children to adults seems to be less, uh, less efficient uh, than from adults to adults. So that's important. Uh, and also that there are data that have shown that the rates of transmission within schools, again, are very limited. Most of the of the infections amongst, uh, amongst teachers and so on and other uh, school personnel have been acquired in the community. They've not been acquired in the schools themselves. So the most important thing is to, is to make sure that the schools are safe. And that means, of course, uh, uh, paying attention to ventilation, to the spacing between the students, uh, to face covering if they're of the right age and can wear a mask. And, uh, and I think we have, uh, again, we have the evidence that said that this has kept our schools uh, as, as safe environments. Certainly, again, teachers who are involved in in-classroom instruction, they are part, at least in New York State, they are part of the group uh, that is eligible uh, to get vaccinated. Uh, but again, we, the, the data overall are quite reassuring about the situation itself of COVID in schools, even without the vaccine. So the vaccine can be an additive uh, protective measure, uh, but it's, it's not necessary uh, to restrict return to school uh, until every, every uh, not just teacher, but every staff person at a school is vaccinated.